so well very warm welcome to all of you uh, so i am chalab bhatnagar i am currently the chair of the csa the computer science and automation department the department itself has completed 50 years uh, of its existence and we are celebrating the golden jubilee of the department this year and so as part of it we are uh, we have a series of lectures uh, being organized what we call as the csa golden jubilee frontier lecture series and we are fortunate to have professor sajal das who is visiting uh, csa and isc as satish dhawan visiting chair professor he is a professor at the missouri university of science and technology uh, he is a very prolific researcher and we are very fortunate to have him here and to introduce him formally may i request professor gopinath good evening it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today uh, sajal das is uh, currently a professor of computer science and with a endowed chair at missouri university of science and technology and uh, he was also the chair of this department uh, between 2013 and 17 prior to that he was at uh, university of texas arlington where he was the founding director of a center for research in wireless mobility and networking and uh, between 2008 and 2011 he was also uh, at nsf as a program director uh, and he spearheaded a collaboration program uh, which included wireless networks mobile and pervasive computing smart environments cps iot's cyber security distributed and cloud computing social and biological networks applied graph theory and game theory as was mentioned before is a prolific uh, uh, researcher with many uh, publications and he has also written uh, many book chapters and also many books his most recent book is titled um, principles of cyber physical systems an interdisciplinary approach by cambridge university press and i'm told it will be available soon and uh, uh he's also uh, been influential in uh, founding new uh, conferences and journals uh, and also being part of existing highly well, uh, let's say um, uh, well known journals for example he's a found, uh, founding editor in chief of pervasive and mobile computing journal associate editor of the ieee transactions and dependable and secure computing and is also an editor of the acm transactions on sensor networks he has uh, 10 best research uh, best paper awards at uh, prestigious conferences like acm mobicom so he has also got uh, university of missouri system president's award for sustained career excellence and on the last one i would say he is also an alum of csa okay with that i would like to invite uh, professor sajal das to give his lecture thank you Thank you Professor Gopinath for the nice introduction Dr Prasad Bhatnagar for the kind invitation I'll take this opportunity to introduce some of the teachers that I have had at ISC and the golden memory and I'd like to recognize them before I start my talk on this side Professor Vital Rao with whom I had abstract algebra and linear algebra classes Professor Kekan Nambiar had graph theory class with him Professor Vijay Tikekar combinatorics and recursive function theory class Professor Vani Madhavan, analysis of algorithms. I did not have any classes with Professor N. Vishnadham or Professor U. R. Prasad, but I fondly remember them. Uh, is there any other professors that I see from my time? But anyway, and lots of good colleagues, Professor Narahari. We spent a lot of time together at ISC while doing masters. Uh, <clears throat> so before I start my talk, uh, just a couple of things that I'm very fortunate, honored. and humbled to give uh, this frontier lecture for the csa 50 golden jubilee in this lecture room i was a student long time ago over here first batch of one and a half years me and first batch of gate exam uh, in 1984 i had the opportunity to be in this room to listen to professor chandrasekhar who just got nobel prize in physics and 
I'm standing in the same podium now talking, so that is very nostalgic to me in that opinion. And since then, of course, a lot of things have happened. <clears throat> uh, so what I'm going to do is give a guided tour of many things that we have been doing in the last couple of decades on smart environments and let least have our physical systems, internet of things. So it will not be just one thing, a good landscape of different research that we have been doing. It will have a combination of breadth and depth, uh, keeping in mind the heterogeneity of the audience. Uh, so please bear with me, and if you want to know more of technical details, I'm here till December 10th on campus in CSA building, so I'm reachable. I can also talk right after this talk. So with that introduction, so, <clears throat> so 50th anniversary, of course, in our department in Missouri University of Science and Technology, four years ago, we celebrated 50th anniversary in 2015. And at that time, the department actually chose smart computing as the theme going forward for the next a few decades. So in that sense, my talk is very much aligned with that. So a little bit on my academic journey over here. So I did my bachelor's in computer science and engineering at Calcutta University, also the first batch of computer science and engineering there. Then I came here to do my master's, uh, golden time, one and a half years, but memory is still very strong and fond, it's, it's unforgettable. I'll ask a few basic question over here. The first batch of GATE exam. I'm sure that all the students who are doing master's and PhD, you went through the GATE exam, right? Guess how many students took the GATE exam in the first year? Hmm? 10,000? 2,000? 10,000, 2,000? Huh? Less than 1,000? Precisely 107. In not many places they had offered computer science degree, right? So that was the first batch, so 107. So if you just miss one question, you know how you can slide on the percentile, right? Anyway, uh, then I went to do my PhD at Washington State University. Professor Narsingh Dev was visiting as a uh, visiting faculty, doing his sabbatical in computer science department. That's the way I got to know him. Uh, he is a graph theorist, Professor Narsingh Dev. But then a couple of years later, he moved to University of Central Florida. Uh, I also moved with him. I'm going, showing a directed graph over here. You can see that graph will be an integral component of anything that I do, right? Then my first job was at the University of North Texas. I went through all the professorial rank. Then at UT Arlington, as Professor Gopinath mentioned, went to NSF for two and a half years as a program director, came back. Then I was just thinking what would be my next step to do something new, and I was in my comfort zone. So I chose to become a department chair elsewhere so that I can do something different. And I'm there, and if I just close the loop, I'm spending my good time in this semester at uh, IIC, you can see that there's a closed cycle over there as well, with one parallel age in the director cycle. Anyway, you may wonder about that when I put that Thomas Alva edition is, is in my academic genealogy. And it is truly, and one of my academic grandson actually found it out. And how do you read this one? So I got my PhD from University of Central Florida under Professor Narsingh Dev, who got PhD from Northwestern University, advisor was this, Professor Hakimi, who got PhD from Arbana Champaign, advisor was Valkenberg, like that. So that's the way you read it. And if you go through this chain, so basically, I highlighted a couple of things over here, because I worked at NSF, and I was very proud that NSA founder was in my academic genealogy, and he was at MIT. And of course, it goes all the way. So without much ado, let me just start what you wanted to hear. So this is the outline of my talk. So I kept my talk as a combination of breadth and depth. So keeping that heterogeneity in mind, as I mentioned. So first part would be like 20, 25 minutes would be about the smart living vision. You hear about smart X, smart home, smart hospital, smart kindergarten, smart railway, all sorts of different things, smart energy. Uh, but what we are taking it to the next level, that's why I say next frontier, smart living, because smart X is not about making that bridge smart or that building smart or the airport smart. It involves us as people. So humans should be part of the whole ecosystem over there. And I'll talk about some of the challenges that we talk about, right? So 
Who cares about the building is secure if ourselves or the society are not safe and secure? Just think about that way. Or efficiency ways, whatever. An integral component of the enabling technologies over there would be sensors, cyber physical systems, and IoT, and blah, blah, blah. We'll define smart environment. <clears throat> then I'll talk about a few pillars of smart living that we have been working on. And of course, the showing that the fundamental uh, problems that we have is quite a lot. Lots of algorithmic stuff, lots of theory that one can develop. Because one can always build a smart system or a smart city putting gadgets. That's an engineering exercise. Question is, what are the fundamental problems underneath? Right? So I'll actually touch upon some of them. We'll not do a good justice in going into the details. But at least define the problem, show how you can tackle it. And then, as I mentioned, that I'm around to talk more. <clears throat> so since the advent of wireless sensors in the mid-90s, I think our world has been different. Because we can observe the physical world because you can collect data. And the data collection, of course, we all have as living creatures sense organs, but that's not enough to do large scale sensing and data collection. And that gives us the power to understand physical environment as well as control it. So it is not only data collection from the physical environment that goes to the cyber environment, but also crank the data, do the analytics over there, and feed back to the physical environment to improve the performance or whatever that you can think of. And examples are there. Many of you are probably very much familiar with different applications of sensor networks, monitoring, uh, data collection, decision making. All these things are very integral part of it. <clears throat> I'll just, for the sake of completeness, uh, talk about a few things which are very basic, but still, a sensor node actually looks like a coin. But what else you see is motherboard. It has all the other accessories. The loading, unloading, uh, computing units, and all that, and the huge part of the battery, right? You can also have image and camera sensing over here. The sensor node itself has three components. One is sensing and actuation component. You can sense something, you can take some small action, which is the control part. It's a wireless communication. I'm talking to wireless sensors as opposed to sensors that I can plug in on the socket. Also. And also some computational power. There's some memory, some computation that you can do en route. And of course, many of the things that you do in the background. So that's the way it looks like. So it has a combination of sensing, communication, computation, and control, which is actuation. And that actually tells me that a sensor is, by definition, a miniature cyber physical system, which I'll be defining later. A cyber physical system is an integration of sensing, communication, computing, and control. That's why you do not imagine designing a cyber physical system without having sensor as the building block. IoT also cannot be conceptualized without sensing and actuation component. Okay? So this is a very basic building block. Itself is a micro level miniature cyber physical system. Now, sensors, of course, are very tiny. Uh, we are talking, we're not talking about a bulky sensor that you can put a huge battery on it, that I can put on a bridge and underneath a huge battery. But I cannot do that. These are deployable in open fields, for example, agricultural field, monitoring mud slide, or whatever you can think, earthquake monitoring, right? So the sensors do not have enough communication power. So each sensor has two units. One is a communication radius through the antenna, and the sensing radius, and both are physical fields, vector fields. Sensing field or electromagnetic field, right? So since they cannot communicate with everybody far apart, so basically you form a network, multi-hub network. So this is a static configuration of a network. You collect all the data through a sink or base station, goes to the internet. I can also have mobile sensors where the sensors are mounted on vehicles or robots move around and collect data. That's both are possible. So typically what happens is an abstraction of an application. So let's say I have an agricultural field monitoring or forest fire monitoring, you drop sensors in some way, deploy the sensors, they collect data, and different types of sensors, multimodal sensors, you collect data, you process it, and make some decisions. But in a sensing, sensor network itself is this part, data collection and processing. But if I feed back an action from that layer to over to the physical environment again, that loop, feedback control loop, will basically make it a cyber physical system. So physical to cyber, cyber to physical, okay? Now, most of the time, as I mentioned, that 
Uh, anything that you do has a, some algorithms, graphs, some analysis is there. So most often you take any arbitrary sensor network as a graph. This is an arbitrary graph. And if you deploy the sensors randomly, it becomes a random geometric graph. Why geometric? Because the connectivity or adjacency between two nodes is distance limited based on how far you can communicate with. So two nodes, U and V, if they are within their radio communication range, wireless communication range, I have an edge. Otherwise, I don't have an edge. So each sensor node has a communication radius. If I assume omnidirectional antenna, it should be spherical unit. This model, I can also have a sensing radius, typically less than RC communication radius. That also could be a disk model. The different models are there for sensing. Binary sensing basically means that within a particular range of the sensing radius, I can sense. Beyond that, I cannot. Probabilistic sensing means my sensing intensity attenuates as I go further, similar to any other physical field, like electromagnetic field and uh, gravitational field. So the different models are there. Uh, lately, for the last 8, 10 years, we have been sensing a proliferation of the smartphones. And smartphone sensing is becoming a very vital part of the research. Each phone has 12 to 14 sensors, different kinds of sensors. And smartphone sensing actually gives human to interact with the physical world and the cyber world. So I'll talk about the cyber physical human systems, because human is also part of the whole ecosystem in making decisions. Okay. Now, what is a cyber physical human system? So cyber physical systems is cyber physical to cyber, cyber to physical. But if you think about now you put human in the loop, so it becomes basically physical, cyber, human, a tripartite, tri tripartite interactions of the physical environment, cyber environment, and human. An extremely interesting and challenging problem from a fundamental pers perspective. So basically, what we are talking about is CPH is integration of sensing, communication, computing, control with human in the loop. Example, think about flying an aircraft. So aircraft, Boeing, or Airbus, that's the physical system. It is run by an autopilot system, which is real-time embedded software, which takes care of everything after takeoff and before landing. Navigation, rerouting, everything. And then captain, pilot, they're sitting there to take control. Do you need takeoff, landing, emergency control? So it's a, it's a physical, cyber, human. That actually does the thing, right? So, so what do you have? This is just a pictorial diagram. You have sensing, smart sensing to collect data. Huge number of intelligent networking to exchange information. You put your favorite network cloud. Pervasive or ubiquitous computing over there for cranking the data through edge, fog, cloud, whatever way you think your computational paradigms are. Then, of course, there's an intelligent control. Because if you remember, I mentioned you collect data and then you take some decisions. This is giving an abstraction first. And then human in the loop. And of course, you develop the software in the middleware over there. But what I'll be hinging on throughout my talk is this is a very simple paradigm sensing, reasoning, control, or action. You sense? Power actually comes from this reasoning part. That's why you have all the algorithms, models, everything sitting over there. That could be your data analytics algorithm, machine learning algorithm, decision making algorithm, everything over there, and you take control action. So showing now the cyber physical human, you have the physical environment, you collect data through sensing, cyber environment, you feedback, that's a cyber physical system. Now human is a part of the whole game. In the human side also world, we also have a physical world, all of us in this room with some uh, kind of common interactions or people that you interact with physically versus your cyber world in the online social network where you may not meet the people, they're far apart from each other, but you're connected in the cyber world. So human world also has a physical world and the cyber world. And you can see that this tripartite connection, physical, cyber, human. Now, what does it mean? So I'll just make one comment over here. So I do not see any difference between CPS and IoT. It is two sides of the coin. CPS is a macro level phenomena. For example, when I say smart grid, electrical grid controlled by sensors and actuator, that's a cyber physical system. Aircraft, uh, air traffic system is a cyber physical system. But everything is basically built or based on the sensing actuation. Now some of them we call it IoT devices. So it's a macro concept versus a micro concept. Very big, small building block over there. Now, this is the interesting part over here. <clears throat> so what we have, we have a, a physical world. Everything is physics-based model. Natural laws are the guiding factor. Continuous time. 
right? Now, I'm collecting data which goes into the cyber world. I don't have any natural laws. I have computational models. I have a Turing machine model or any of the other models that you can think, software abstractions, network protocol stack, digital clock. Aircraft run by continuous clock, the physical system, guided by autopilot navigation system, which is a cyber system or digital clock running. And then on top of that, you put human, which is your pilot, captain, or whoever is managing the system. There is no natural law. There is no computational model. Uh, it's guided by their behavior, their psychology, their intent. You can see that I'm talking about a system that we are facing day to day in our life. Our life is at stake, is interacting between these three worlds and with different sets of rules and guiding principles. Right? Extremely challenging because see any clock drift or skewness in the clock can actually create havoc over there. But good thing is that some of the systems have been very reliably built over the years, and we are still safe, right? So that's what actually is so when you have a cyber physical system, the research is ne never technical anymore. It's socio-technical research. How do you bring human behavior, uh, all these things into the model? Extremely challenging. There are a lot of theories that are coming from socio-economic theory and adaptation of that in different contexts, okay? Like prospect theory, uh, different kinds of influential models, different kinds of things are actually emerging. So a couple of more slides to give the vision first. So what we are looking for, we are saying that IoT is a building block that enables societal scale cyber physical human systems. So you just put your building blocks over here, different types of networking scenarios, okay? And different types of applications that you want to realize. Cyber physical systems, smart grid, smart healthcare, smart transportation, water distribution, disaster management, or you put your other favorite applications over there, right? Now, main challenge that we are facing in the research community is basically how to build the middle where that will basically interconnect everything. Because most of the research in the CPH or CPS is in silos. The solution or algorithms, models that you develop for smart grid has nothing to do with transportation, has nothing to do with healthcare. So it's repetitive effort because we don't have the mathematical underpinning and understanding. So what we are actually looking for so are quite many that are there fundamental invariants that we can find so that we can develop models. To some extent, they fall under the same umbrella, then we tweak it and optimize it for different applications so that I don't have to write applications for different types of application scenarios or models or the solutions, right? That's the goal, which is extremely challenging because many of the cyber physical systems are interdependent. They are not independent. So handling them in silo actually does not help much to get the right model. Okay? That's what we are looking for, and others are as well. Some dents that we are making. So systems are extremely complex, system of systems. You can assume very heterogeneous, scale, micro to macro scale, very large, lots of data. And challenge is basically how to make these systems extremely reliable, robust, and secure so that you can make the secure and trustworthy decisions. So I'm keeping many things in the abstraction for the time being so that I can talk about some of the models. Now, underneath, of course, we are making these systems extremely smart. We wrote a book with my colleague, Diane Cook, in 2005, where we, it's the first book of its kind, and a lot of research has actually spawned, and that was triggered by a project that we got funded in 2001 to build smart home and do the underlying research. And how we defined it very qualitatively, and then we, of course, tried to do lots of models to quantify. A smart environment is one that is able to acquire and apply knowledge autonomously about the environment at its inhabitants with a goal to adapt to improve their experience without explicit awareness. Lots of keywords over here. And this also basically generalizes the concept Mark Weiser had from Xerox Park research on ubiquitous computing. Later, it became actually pervasive computing. So basically, you're making intelligent, a system intelligent and making decisions in an automated manner without users' explicit awareness. Okay, That's the way the smartness is coming. But the key to all these things is that identify, recognizing context. 
It's not the raw data that you collect which is important. It's the context. Simple example, let's say I have a body area sensor network monitoring the health condition, vital records and everything. The temperature sensor on the body gives a high temperature reading. What would be your interpretation? That's a simple question. Let's say I have a body area sensor network monitoring the vital conditions like my temperature, pressure, different kinds of other vital records. And the temperature sensor on the body gives a high temperature reading. What would be your interpretation? I have a fever. How many of you believe that I may have a fever? OK. And what about the rest? What do you think? So I do not, so the raw data does not define any context. It's a unimodal data from one, some sensors, right? Maybe multiple sensors, but still unimodal. Uh, so I need to define the state information. What is my state? Am I sitting on a couch, sleeping on a bed, sitting idle on a chair? Then high temperature may mean I have a fever. If I'm jogging, running, my heartbeat went up, I'm taking a hot bath, I'm on the hot sun, then my state is different. So you need a semantic interpretation from multimodal sources. So if I'm running, jogging, a kinetic sensors will give me that motion information. If I'm taking hot bath, ambient sensors in the infrastructure will give me that information. And I put a semantic interpretation or logic to define a context. That's what context means. And the sequence of data from multiple sources with an interpretation becomes a context. Sequence of context with an interpretation becomes a situation. There's an accident on the road. That may lead to a situation awareness that you may have to dispatch ambulance, police, paramedics, all sorts of stuff. But every accident is not like that. So again, like sequence of context, and in that case, an accident means there's an impact. There's an image that somebody is injured and incapacitated. There's a damage on the car. All sorts of different information that you get together with an interpretation that becomes a situation. But when you got this project, for, I'm giving historical background. We were relatively young computer scientists and engineers. We thought we can change the world. And we are fatally wrong, because what we could detect as a context is this context. Any type of context that I can capture through devices, like sensors, transducers, right? Different types of context that I can measure, like as I said, temperature. OK, my location over here. I'm tracking that event. But our daily life is not guided by only technical context, but very human-centric context, context. That actually are more powerful, because what you do is because of all these things. Your desire, mode, behavior, intent. Extremely difficult to capture, because these are very personalized. The same stimulus that makes somebody happy can make somebody else sad. And vice versa. If we had captured those contexts, I could stop a suicide. I could stop a terrorist attack. Extremely difficult. There are EEG headgears to collect brain signals, but we don't have enough data. And in science and engineering, we define model, which is one size fits all. It's a statistical model that works for many different things. I'm standing over here. A sensor or camera can capture it. Cat sits over here. Same information can be captured. Professor Arura Kumar is here. Only I have to distinguish who is who. But the same algorithm would work, same model would work. But when it's human-centric, we have lots of models from socioeconomic theory, but still we don't have enough data to plug in in the socio-technical context. Extremely challenging. I'm focusing on that because that's a fertile area of doing research. Okay. Now, coming back to the model side to some extent. So we do not actually worry too much about this engineering the system and putting gadgets. We can do it. But in abstraction, what do we see? For example, if this is my smart home, I want to see the abstraction of it. You put all sorts of gadgets over here, but I treat a smart home or smart environment or a smart city as a rational agent. What do I mean by that? It can perceive the state of the home or the environment through sensors and act on it by actuators. That's the first thing, right? sensing and actuation. And I can also reason about it. I can learn things, I can predict things, and make intelligent decisions. So that's the abstraction of it, right? Now, what does it mean? You take a snapshot of your bedroom, let's say one section of your home, you're sensing the environment. So basically, I want to make these homes very smart. That should 
actuate things based on your activity, your habits, your preferences, all sorts of different things. And once I collect the data, the most of the power actually comes from here. You develop the learning algorithms, decision making algorithms, data analytics and everything, then you take an action. Right? This is an abstraction. It, is, it may look like a two-stage two -stage Markov model, but that's not true. I can hierarchically decompose it because my home may have four stories, and, you can, and each flo floor may have a lot of room. You can actually decompose hierarchically. It's a very recursive decomposition. And the good thing is that I'm actually coming back to that again and again, that I can replace that environment to a smart city. Because the same algorithm, only the scale will be different. Okay? So what it basically means that in a smart city context, if you can read, there are lots of different things that there is smart manufacturing, agriculture, smart grid, smart building, transportation, health, everything, right? So I can actually take these building blocks and independent components and develop models in a hierarchical manner. Okay? Uh, this is a little, I think the contrast is not good. <clears throat> so coming back, what I'm saying again, like summarizing the smart living is the way to go. It's not one or the other. It's the interdependent cyber physical human systems which are interacting with each other and guiding principle is still sensing, reasoning, control. Very simple paradigm, but this loop actually helps us to build intelligence into the system. Okay? And you can actually put your favorite building block of your application. This is mostly whatever you have there. If it was not visible, I just pointed out over here. In fact, we wrote a paper a couple of years ago we called Internet of People. And that actually got very good citations so far because we are talking about this human dynamic, social behavior, all these things in the picture. Okay, now let's go into the smart living pillars. What do I mean by that? <clears throat> the convergent research and the data science approach because everything will be based on data that we collect and some case study we'll talk about. So, very quickly, I, what I talked about, I'm summarizing. We are doing a lot of research on the wireless sensor, IoT, CPS, and crowd sensing, different applications like smart grid, smart healthcare, smart transportation, disaster response. We also call that as resilience. That means something happens and you bring back to normalcy. And disaster is a very good case study there. So eventually, through this sensing and device, smart device, we are collecting lots of data. And that's the reasoning part. We are just cranking those data, eventually developing all sorts of smart solutions with huge economic impact civilian and you know, innovation opportunity as well. And we have to also see the lots of fundamental problems are there which I have not talked yet. Now four things I'll be focusing on over here as a convergent research is the mobility trans or trans human mobility or transportation, energy, health, and resilience. That means anything happens, any perturbation happens in our society, daily life, infrastructure, I should be able to bring back to normalcy. But what is the goal? Goal is to define or develop unified models and frameworks and algorithms, particularly invariance. Remember I was talking about interdependent cyber physical systems. Are you solving them in silos or we have some kind of invariant which de defines some common theme so that I can make secure and trustworthy decisions? Because if I cannot, the fight I'll be taking, let's say tomorrow, if the decisions are not secure and trustworthy, that could actually create a lot of havoc. A simple example, or healthcare application. In the process, what we have developed, different types of models, sometimes adopting existing mathematical theory or adapting them in the right context because your sometimes scale is huge, uncertainty is huge. The way you collect the data, in the sensor intensity may not be enough, so you cannot make any decisions. Also, sometimes computation in the presence of incomplete information, noisy information, like that. Right? So different types of problems that you can study. Mostly the fundamental problems will come from sensors and IOTs and different types of models that you can develop. <clears throat> so let's give a few quick overview of the different things you have been working on in terms of the smart mobility, smart energy, health, and resilience. And this slide will be more of an overview rather than any specific things. Okay? So in smart mobility, we are looking both human mobility as well as vehicular mobility, including vehicular cyber physical systems where users can interact through mobile phones, giving information. For example, I'm 
driving from here to MG Road, there's a huge traffic jam. I can actually supply that information that goes into the cloud. Lots of drivers are doing that. It can be processed and some broadcast information will go to the other drivers and they can take a decision whether to divert their routes or be in the congestion forever. Okay, so that's a vehicular server physical system. We have also been looking into some vehicular social networks. It's the intersection of vehicular networking and social networks. Very interesting paradigm is coming, VSN we call it, as well as internet of vehicles. So the goal over here is predicting human and vehicular mobility uh, with the hope that we can detect false event reporting. For example, there could be a bunch of crude guys who gives the wrong information there's a traffic jam, which is in reality not true, and that would, might actually divert many people to the secondary tertiary roads, creating further congestions in other places, right? So how to detect those? And good understanding of human and vehicular mobility helps us in transport planning, congestion control, even monitoring air quality in certain areas because of the emissions. And human mobility, of course, is responsible for epidemics or disease spread through contagious diseases, right? So lots of applications are there. What we have been looking at, developing solutions for those problems with the goal using different types of theory. And I'll not repeat, I'll just throw it over here. It will be there for quite some time as I flash through the slides. Uh, and again, like just to show that we have been publishing quite regularly in those areas, the blue ones are the journal papers and the black ones are the conference papers. So I'll keep that one. So smart energy space, what are we doing? We are looking at mostly the microgrid side or the energy consumption through the customer side. I'm not dealing with energy distribution and generation part, okay? Because this part is more interesting because you deal with IoT device called smart meter, right? So if somebody can, an adversary can tamper the smart meter data through false data injection, a lot of interesting things may happen. That means you'll be paying much more bill than what should be. Because it's a safety issue because suddenly I create a false data injection means an electrical surge, your circuit breaker may not be able to handle that. That will also have secondary effect on the demand response because suddenly you create a brownout or blackout because you had artificial uh, consumption. All sorts of different things may happen. So what we are looking for, very interesting set of theory that we are developing over here, detecting anomalies in uh, false data injection, mitigating cascade failures, and making secure trust of the decision. I can tell you one thing that remember I was talking about how to develop common invariants. So here we, are, we have seen that. So basically the data is coming as a time series data of energy consumption, okay? Statistical data, for example, if I'm monitoring the temperature of this building throughout the year, take samples every 10 seconds or 10 minutes, I'll get huge amount of data coming, right? This time series data, I have historical analysis of that, so statistical analysis I can do. But see, typically what we do, to create any anomalies, detect any anomalies, you look into the mean and the variance of the standard deviation, right? But I can actually, we have shown from real data from 5,000 houses data that we have access to that the fluctuations are too huge, the mean and the variance actually cannot tell you much, right? So we were looking for different types of invariance. What we found out, harmonic mean to arithmetic mean ratio is a very stable invariant for this type of applications and many others, in, even the same works for smart transportation data, vehicular data. So harmonic mean to arithmetic mean ratio, now you can mathematically prove it's very stable invariant to detect anomalies. When there is any anomaly, there's a sharp transition that I can detect, okay? So that is one of the invariants that we are actually proposing. At least we have evidence that it works very well in terms of theory uh, in smart grid, smart transportation, smart water distribution network. And we are hoping that it will also work for public health or disease spread, but we don't have enough data to validate. Smart health, so mostly we look into cognitive health area more than the physical health area, particularly dementia detection, uh, early detection of Alzheimer's and uh, Parkinson's, for example. We are working with a neurologist MD in the hospital to make good understanding of the data and getting the truth uh, ground truth from them, from the MRI and CAT scan. Uh, so fine grained activity recognition under uncertainty, that's the key part. And we have actually developed a system. In fact, 
I'm also co-founder of a startup company called Smart Health Beckons, which is peer-headed by my postdoc. It was part of an NSF research that we had. Uh, we have a couple of patents uh, filed. So we are looking into how to do continuous monitoring of people for early indication of any dementia. So it is not like somebody already has it, and then by the time you go to the doctor, it's too late. There's an article a couple of years ago in Time magazine, first page article, cover page, that by the time dementia is detected, it's too late. Damage is done mostly. Right? So question is, continuous monitoring can help because doctors see the patients in epochs. And what goes in between, they have no idea, unless somebody really reports to them on a continuous basis. So the different methodology that we have been using, mostly very critical because security and health applications are so critical that any uncertainty in the information may make a wrong outcome and wrong decision, wrong diagnosis, uh, misdetection of a security threat. Extremely challenging questions. And the last one, resilience, I'll just have no picture over here. Again, like creating a technology enabled multi-level security framework to monitor, detect, and prevent or recover from natural and man-made disaster. Man-made disaster is terrorist attack. So it's a common framework. We had an NSA proposal funded on that. Uh, we finished it a couple of years ago. Lots of interesting uh, uh, research that we have done on that. I'm mindful of my time. And you know, I think that's a common phenomenon for all of us who teach that professors, they know how to start. They hardly know how to stop because because of the passion that you have. So let's just quickly go over some of the algorithms that you, I'll, I'll probably define the problem and show what are the things that you can do without any good justice to them because of the interest of time as well as the um, things that you mentioned. So, so energy efficient sensor fusion is a very key component because you're getting data from multiple sense sources. How do you fuse them? And most of the fusion is not at the data level or information level, but at the semantic level. Because as I mentioned, Temperature, high temperature in such and such state of the system means this, otherwise something else. Right? Sensing coverage and connectivity is also very important because if I cannot cover every point in the monitoring area, then of course I'm less hopeful to do anything good. It all depends on the application again. So cover sense coverage actually comes from the sensing side. Very nice geometric problems are there, lots of geometric problems. And connectivity is, comes from the wireless communication side, that means is the network connected, right? Mobile charging. So sensors are very hungry in terms of the power. So the way I deploy in different, it's not like deployment in the building, but let's say in an open field, in a forest fire monitoring, earthquake monitoring, you may not be able to replenish the battery that easily. You may not even know where the sensors got dropped. Once you drop in large areas through helicopters. You can do localization, but still changing the battery is not easy. But there are a lot of research is going on. We are doing as well mobile charging. That means I have a vehicle with enough charging capacity to go and wirelessly charge them. OK? Interesting set of problems. Lifetime maximization is always an issue, because how do you keep the network very alive for a longer time? And mobility tracking. Uh, so a lot of other problems are there, but I'll briefly touch upon. So, so what is a fusion? So fusion basically means that I'm giving a very simplistic uh, illustration. So let's say node A and node C, they are sampling at any instance R bytes of data, or R bits of data. I'm keeping it uniform. It could be R1, R2. If this is a fusion point, if there are a lot of special, spatiotemporal redundancy or correlation, what goes out should be less than 2R. If not, then it will be additive, because that means there is no correlation. Right? That's what it means. And if, I, if there are correlation, a good fusion algorithm also will help reduce the network load and what goes out through the communication link. Right? Because I'm reducing, see, data sensing takes energy. Communication takes energy. Fusion or computation also takes energy. OK? And my objective is to reduce the energy consumption as well. So units are basically the energy. And I can talk everything in terms of bits of computation, sensing, communication, and the nanojoules, microjoules, whatever is the energy requirement. Now, if I'm doing scalar sensing, like temperature, humidity, pressure, then sensing does not take much energy. And even 20,000 data points take an average of the temperature. Big deal, right? So mostly it is free. So most of the research 
that was done before we basically jumped on twin still that is more than 10 years ago and series of papers you have written that it is not free if you are talking about vector sensing <coughs> image sensing for example As, for example i'm sending ecg uh, image or mri scanning image of a patient to the hospital through wireless or sensory sensing that right we have actually done very simple experiment i'm not an image processing guy but simple experiment through uh, sensing through mode sensor basically let's say you have two images and you are basically fusing them what does it mean so this image has actually blurriness or uncertainty over here this has over here and basically i want to get the maximum information out of it good application is a crime scene there's a shooting over here some image was captured over there some over there some from other side and then everybody got a partial view but you want to basically recreate the scene that's the example right even for two image fusion what we have seen that cost in terms of energy per bit of information processing is 70 to 80 nanojoules per bit for a specific type of sensors for mode sensor whereas the specification for the communication cost coming from the vendor is 90 to 100 nanojoules if i put three image you can imagine that so that means your fusion cost may be as large as or if not more than the communication cost so earlier it was assumed fusion cost is almost zero you just deal with the communication cost okay which is not true so what it basically means that if i have a large sensor network and i'm collecting data en route doing fusion before the information goes to the base station of the sink i need to dynamically decide whether to fuse or not to fuse is fusion beneficial or not okay so in an abstraction what am i doing so basically i have a sensor network i'm con constructing a fusion driven routing tree you can assume virtually a bottom up tree construction en route wherever is possible you do the fusion only if the fusion is beneficial the question is how do i model it how do i develop the algorithms right it's a dynamic decision optimization problem and i'll do a parametric formulation of the problem very simple one so one can actually we have also proved it basically if i want to optimize a fusion driven routing tree such that the total link and the node costs are minimized is a special case of a constraint steiner optimized tree optimization this is an npr problem uh, and the routing topology actually determines very much the decision control fuse or not to fuse okay and you are basically trading off in real time as much as possible between fusion cost and the communication cost fusion cost is the node cost communication cost is the link cost and if i know i have to fuse then question be what to fuse and when to fuse okay these are the decisions you have to make but i don't know much what is happening so i can do a simple formulation of the problem so your network is a graph each sensor is a node there's an edge between two sensors if they are in their wireless communication range okay simple definition i'm converting everything in terms of energy cost and the per bit of information processing either for the fusion or communication i'm keeping away the sensing energy part away for the time being right so i'm assuming for any link e so ce energy information at any time i'm sensing let's say this much of amount of information sampling okay so what is the communication fusion always i'm just showing what is happening on a single link first to understand the problem so there's a link e between node u and v you send some information to v somebody else is also sending information to v so basically fusion will happen over here okay so fusion so this communication cost is basically the transmission cost you can think is the amount of information that i gathered over here time the unit cost that i have simple but then i'll actually try to take collection of links which makes the tree right and the fusion cost whatever was sampled over here till the basically means whatever was sampled before the fusion happened i'm assuming v is my fusion node so what i sampled over here what i sampled before fusion if there is no correlation this thing will actually pass out of this node right if there is a correlation a fraction will go out that fraction is my quotient e i do not know what it is right now i'm doing a parametric formulation so if i assume that there is between these two nodes u and v over the link e there is a 
correlation of sigma. I am normalizing it between 0 and 1. There is no correlation means 0. That means this term is 1. That means everything goes out of the link. If there is a correlation, let's say 10 percent correlation, this will be 0.9. So that QE that I had quotient will be 0.9. So you can actually do that. And that sigma will come from the signal processing. Because signal, analyzing two signals, I can see how much correlation is there. So for each link, I am making a decision whether to fuse or not to fuse. I put a Boolean for each link. A zero means there is no fusion, one means there is a fusion, right? So I am actually modulating now this correlation with this Boolean. Right? So no fusion means zero, that means no matter what correlation I have, this becomes zero, everything goes out. Okay? Otherwise, I will just take the correlation part and do it. So that is the way I am just doing it very simple. Now once I have that for each link, I can actually formulate the problem for the entire tree, right? It is a constructive fusion tree that gathers all sensory data while minimizing the total cost over nodes and links. So it should basically be wherever I do the fusion, a subset of nodes, a subset of links are the edges where I do the fusion. And there is another subset of links where I do not do the fusion because that Boolean is 0. Either Boolean is 1 or 0, right? If there is no fusion, so the cost is only the transmission or communication cost. If there is a fusion, the total cost will be this much for that link. Then I do for all possible links and the, you just basically take whatever is that tree that will minimize. So basically over all sets of trees, that's the right. And again, you can actually show that this problem is an NP hard problem. What we have done, we have developed lots of randomized algorithms online, offline, centralized and distributed algorithms. Simple algorithms, but very powerful algorithms. And we call this set of solutions as adaptive fusion Steiner tree problem algorithms. Okay? Uh, so I will give you a simple example of what is happening. So if you think about the this example may not illustrate all the nuances of it. So a bottom up tree that you are constructing. So basically I you are making a decision fuse or not fuse. Is fusion beneficial or not? It turns out a very simple observation that I can formulate in terms of the mathematics of it. That if fusion is be not beneficial after a certain point from any source to sink path, then from that point onwards, it will not be beneficial for the rest of the path. Okay? What it basically means that I do the fusion driven routing over here, and after that I do a simple shortest path routing. Okay? Now, these points may vary depending on how you have the things. But this actually helps us to formulate the mathematics of it. Okay? So what we, I will give a simple example of one of the algorithms that we have. So our randomized algorithm also gives the, as a byproduct clustering of this network. That means this sensor network is partitioned into different clusters based on where you do the fusion and where you do not do the fusion. You take the maximum cluster size, I can also compute the approximation ratio, which is 1.5 times log of that size. Right? And baseline is basically I'm doing the comparison in the worst case, which is the I do the fusion all the time. This is the algorithm. I will not go. There are a lot of analysis is there. I will show some simple experiments that we did about 100 sensor nodes quite some time ago, but still it is good to see. So you can, I do not know whether you can see it or not because this looks a little fading. So there is some trade off over here. So what we are measuring over here, how much is the correlation? The closer the sensors are there with each other, there is more correlation. The further apart, the correlation is less, right? So we are looking at the impact in terms of the correlation range, transmission range, and also the cost of fusion, unit cost of the fusion. Okay? And based on that, you can see some trade off over there. If the cost of fusion is very less, then of course our approach is not required because you can do the standard approach that is there. But if the cost of fusion is much higher, then it is important. And we can also talk about a break even point that where actually you perform the very best in terms of fusion cost. Okay? So let's take another interesting problem. So, so you basically deploy sensors to have a sensing coverage. That means every point in the monitoring area is covered by some sensor. Somebody is observing. Most often by more than one sensor for fault tolerance. Right? Think about border security between two countries. I cannot say 90% of the time the border is observed and monitored. 
right? Or a museum artifact. It's a kind of art gallery problem in some sense, right? But it's more than that. So, but for certain other applications, I have the opportunity to do a graded or probabilistic coverage. I may not need 100% coverage all the time. Agricultural field monitoring. I'm monitoring moisture level, uh, soil conditions, or temperature and the weather conditions. Right? It all depends on the application. For the health security applications, this graded coverage will not be good. So question is basically, if I know that I can deal with 90% coverage, 95% coverage at any time, I can put many sensors in the sleep mode and have a nice sleep wake up schedule algorithm to s conserve their energy. Okay? So basically, I'll give an example. So let's say this is a field that we are monitoring. I have a lot of sensors that have been deployed, all black dots are sensors. But at any instance, let's say this example, I wake up only six of the sensors which are double circled. And if I take the sensing fields, assuming very simple, you need this model, I can cover certain region, but there are some other gray areas that are not covered. Let's say this was a 90% coverage at any instance, right? But eventually, I want to cover everything so that I have the data points. So in this particular case, if I want to cover the, those patches, so I need to wake up a different subset of sensors, six sensors again, which can cover it. That means I'm still maintaining a desired sensing coverage, let's say 90%, 95%, that is my requirement. But at any instance, I cannot guarantee 100% coverage, which is called graded coverage or probabilistic coverage. Now, interesting thing is basically, the, what is the question? Question is that I don't want to wake up the same subset or common subset of sensors because they'll drain out their battery faster. So I give a random deployment of sensors, that means I have a random topology. How do I choose a subset of sensors, let's say k in number, and every round they'll be disjoint, and within a given delay bound, I can cover the entire field 100%. At any instance, 90% or 80%, whatever is my graded coverage. But at, within a certain delay or rounds, I can cover the entire field. But so one challenge is to select disjoint subsets of sensors, still k in number every round, and guaranteeing that they stay connected. If they're not connected, I cannot do anything. That means I cannot just randomly pick sensors, k up them, if they're not connected, of no use. So that's the question, right? So select k digital subset of connected sensors in each round such that the monitored area will be eventually covered 100% of the time in delta. And the good thing is that if I can do that, I'm basically trading up between sensing coverage and the delay to report the data, right? And again, I'll not go into the details. We have developed four different types of randomized algorithms for this problem. Uh, I can also compute with certain model, what is the minimum number of sensors I need to sample at any time to guarantee that desired sensing coverage? Okay, I can do that, it's a very simple model. And things work in rounds, so I'll actually skip in the interest of time. What I'll mention over here, that this was the crux of it. How do I prove probabilistically with high probability that the graph stays connected? That is, I'm selecting any random subset of sensors, let's say. Not any random, but that's the way I select it so that they stay connected. So I have the coverage, desired coverage satisfied as well as they stay connected, okay? And you can do some simple actually, most of the randomized algorithms that use Sarnoff bounds comes as a natural things to prove certain with high probability. Okay. How much time do I have, Professor Gabinath? A few more minutes, okay. I have a lot of things to show, but I'll just skip many of these things. Uh, so what we have, we have also done experiments on that after developing the randomized algorithms, right? So it's a very nonlinear savings of the energy. So for example, let's say, this is an example. Let's say I'm talking about 80% coverage in terms of 100% coverage, right? I'm sacrificing only less than 7% in terms of the delay. But I'm saving about 40% of the energy. Okay, so it's a nonlinear saving in the energy with a little extra delay, which is the number of rounds that you need. And since the K is a very small number compared to the total uh, size of the network, so most of the nodes will be actually sleeping, so I'm actually conserving the energy. But I'm selecting different subsets of sensors, so uniformizing their uh, lifetime as much as possible. 
Uh, let me give you a couple of more, just one slide for each of the problems. So this problem is very interesting problem, mobile charger. We had a very recent paper a couple of years ago on this one. So the go, so what is the premise? That I have sensors deployed and at different times their battery is going down at different rates, depending on what they do, right? And how do I charge them wirelessly? So I have a mobile charger mounted on a vehicle with its limited energy budget and all. Then it goes around and charges them. There are many different ways to charge, right? So question would be basically the problem is maximize it and reward is basically what the mobile charger gets some reward which is proportional to the amount of charge it gives to a particular sensor, okay? Because the sensor has to, let's say, so amount of reward received from a sensor is proportional to the amount of energy charged. So maximize the sum of rewards collected from the charge sensors by the mobile charger per tour. It makes one round, charges everybody a little bit. Before it drains out its own energy, right? Subject to the energy capacity of the charger. Okay, there are many different ways to solve this problem, uh, but we have developed some nice approximation algorithm with a constant approximation ratio under two scenarios. One is a sensor will be charged to its full energy capacity. That means let's say this much charge is remaining, getting critical, and it's charged to the full capacity. That's one scenario. Another scenario is you don't give them the full charge, but you make multiple trips, the charger, to charge them. Right? So, so there are many variations of this problem that one can think of. Very interesting set of problems. This you can actually use for drone charging, for example, because drones don't have to come back. You can charge from the ground. Uh, you can do vehicular charging, electrical vehicle ch charging, like that, right? And Rahul, actually Rahul Saladi also has observed that maybe this problem can also be converted into some kind of fairness and online algorithms. And we are actually discussing some of those problems as well, like. Uh, question would be basically, let's assume I have a random deployment of sensors and many of the sensors are getting critical in terms of the remaining battery, right? So I want, and, and the, their request for charging is coming in online, okay? How do you charge them and also make sure that you are guarantee some kind of fairness for different sensors that you have, okay? So there could be an opportunity to actually work on that. A generalization of this problem is called team orienting problem. I'll actually skip it. And we have a very nice algorithm. I'll not talk much about it because it is under review right now in a very good conference. Uh, another problem is also interesting, the lifetime maximization of sensor. And a lot of work has been there. Uh, the paper that we wrote actually in Infocom 2013 is called Rasmalai. And the journal version came out in 2015. And acronym you can read from here. So again, the problem is given a random sensor network deployment with energy profiles of different sensors, because these are sensors with different energy. They may not be all uniform, right? Find a data collection tree that maximizes the lifetime. And lifetime has many different definitions. When a single node dies, a fraction of node dies, also different things. But I'm assuming here, this is just the first node dies, right? And for this one, we have developed a very nice randomized algorithm uh, that basically does good load balancing. So think about, I have a data collection tree, think about a bottom up tree, and if you always take the shortest path, the nodes which are closer to the sink will deplete their energy faster, right? So you cannot do that all the time, then they'll die. So question is, you take alternate routes, they may be much longer, right? So how do you balance it out? And when you do the balancing, there is a possibility of oscillation, because you basically switch very frequently there, right? So this randomized algorithm actually leverages this oscillation for faster convergence to derive a class of load balance trees. Uh, and then, of course, you can prove some bounds that how you actually save the energy and maximize the lifetime. Okay, so details are there. So I'll not actually talk about this problem. I'll very quickly go to the conclusion slides because that's an interesting problem. Uh, based on information theory, online algorithms, and dictionary compression. If anybody's interested, we can talk about that. So let's just go to the conclusions. A couple of, a few slides, okay, if you bear with me. I'm summarizing. So sensing, reasoning, control is the starting point that we had. Different types of applications you can think of. Smart living is the underlying theme. <coughs> Some of the work that comparing smart living spaces, that means you have different smart living 
spaces, this campus, that home, that hospital, that road. Figure how many it is very hard to quantify. We have some first order models, but still far away to go. There may be competing and collaborating smart spaces because of the interdependence. So there is lots of game theory that you can apply, and we have done that. If it's a non-hostile environment, cooperative game theory, uh, if it is hostile, even we could not actually map the problem into non-cooperative game theory in an easier way, right? Uh, context recognition is multiple smart spaces. What does it mean? Uh, let's say I'm talking about my lifestyle and information management and mobility tracking in di different smart spaces. Assume everything in the world is smart. I live in a smart house, drive a smart car on a smart road, come to a smart office, at the end of the day I go to a smart shopping complex or fly out of a smart airport or come back to my smart home. Right? But my behavior is different in different, my information base is different. I don't behave the same way I behave at home and at school. Right? Or in the shopping complex. So think about, so as I cross the information uh, bound, smart space boundary, there's a potential chance of information loss. We have applied some red distortion theory and other things, but that's a very interesting question. This is a very challenging question I'm putting forward maybe as a thought process that we are developing systems to be smart, using the technology to do many things for us, but what about the reverse process? You develop the systems very smart, can the smart system help us make better citizens, help us make be better human being? I'll give you very simple examples. Things are there, very, maybe very simple example. Let's say you go to a shopping complex, you're under CCTV. If that was not there, what would happen? So people moderate their behavior, right? So think about it. At my home, there's a sign under surveillance. Even if I don't have the security in place, still people will be careful. Right? So you can just see, that means putting things controls behavior. So now when your house is smart, things are, yes, everything is smart, this thing, that thing. Because today's world is so different. So this is an interesting problem that we are working with cognitive psychologists and trying to model it, but it's an extremely challenging problem, we can say, right? Uh, so let me just go quickly to the very last slide. I have not actually talked much about this one. It's extremely important. Reliability, trust, and belief model. We have been working a lot on that. I'll only leave it over here, the trust between two entities is neither commutative nor transitive. If you have a path, I have trust on every link, I do not know how to propagate the trust. It's not a flow problem that you take the mean. It's not a reliability problem, you take the multiplication of all the pro probabilities. You have a trust consensus, trust is coming from, I'm doing a sense fusion, I do not know the trust of the outcome because it's not a weighted sum. Extremely complex problem. There's different models. One important model comes from actually online purchase and eBay type of applications where Joshua actually defined, and that can be adapted in many different contexts. We have done it. So trust is dependent on reputation and belief. A reputation has a component called belief function between zero and one, let's say normalized. But disbelief is not one minus B. There's a huge uncertainty. And the uncertainty is the information that you don't have. With additional information, your outcome could swing from B to D or D to B. Okay? And actually, there are plenty of instances that you can develop the theory of it. Very interesting set of questions, right? And trust can actually go down with addition. Let's say you, it takes time to get to a good trust between two entities. And also, you can lose the trust with additional information with uncertainty. Okay, so trust can change dynamically. And this is very important because how do you trust the sensor is giving the right information on which you are making decisions, right? I'll skip this one. So last but one slide, smart living is the way to go, I believe, but it's very difficult to quantify the measure of success because of different types of uncertainty that are there. But it's a huge, I think I, all my colleagues who work in algorithms and theory, I encourage that if you look into the space of sensor networks, IoT and all, of course there's lots of engineering, lots of things are there, but underneath there are a huge collection of rich algorithmic problem and models that you can develop, randomized algorithms, online algorithms, approximation algorithms. 
it's a huge fertile area, and making any dent on that actually will advance the technology as well as the impact. So I hope that some of the things that we are discussing will lead to something interesting. Uh, this is the book that uh, Professor Gopinath was mentioning, and we had also written another book in 2012, Securing Cyber Physical Critical Infrastructure. Uh, we are in academics, so I'd like you to read this quotation. It's, I think this is the definition of a master teacher. And whose quotation is this one? Who's Professor Bittolda? I, I like this quotation very much. Every course I teach, this is in my first page on the syllabus. Anybody? Whose quotation is this? Anyone? Yes? It's Rabindranath Thakur. Of course, you, you know by Tagore by Thakur, right? Uh, it's a very fun because he was a master teacher. This picture was taken in 1928 when Tagore was, Thakur was visiting Berlin, wanted to meet uh, Einstein, right? What was the topic of discussion? Anyone? A Nobel laureate physicist and a Nobel laureate poet? Eastern and Western philosophy. A uh, meeting was for half an hour. It continued for more than three hours. That has been recorded. Some of you may know this answer. If you know it, I'll ask you to restrain your instinct. This is my last slide, promise. <laughs> what is this? I said this is an algorithm. An algorithm has some input. And I do have an input. I have two inputs. But you take one input at a time. I have one input which is a flower bud, another input is a cocoon. Right? Of course, I have to, so this input has that output. Is this good? Beautiful? And that cocoon, of course, I wish I had a flying butterfly. It would be even better. So I have an algorithm that transforms this flower bud to a beautiful flower that you cannot take your stairs away or this cocoon is transformed into butterfly, what is that algorithm? If you know the answer, you can just wait for, him, for others to think. You give some time. OK, some random thoughts. Give some time. That's a good question. Anybody else? What else is needed for the transformation? It's a transfer function. You can think about electrical circuits. Right? Anyone? Right conditions. Right conditions, time. What else? Nature, very good. Others, Dilip. All of you are correct, but I have my favorite answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry to take longer uh, than expected. I think everybody's ready to leave. Huh? Oh, whatever. But that's what actually I think that I, I could put ISC as well. I could put an institute, right? But CS is my favorite department, so. Yes, please. <clears throat> if that was the case, then the world will not be like this, what we have today. Every day you hear about all sorts of different things, right? So objective is to improve the quality of life, but it really does not really talk about whether that will make the person better or not. So because we have always seen in one direction, right? Develop technology, solutions, smartness, everything, but we have not seen the, ask the question, what would be the reverse of it, right? Given the smartness is in place, can I take that into account to improve our own behavior? To some extent, it is there. 
because it's a change of behavior, right? Change of. So, so that means somebody is selfish, can we unwind it? Right? Somebody is jealous, can we unwind it? Type of things. Or if I capture the intent also, that means somebody is on the verge of committing suicide. There's some brand signal is probably triggering that, right? Somebody who is implanting a terrorist attack. Possible to improve, possible to improve. But what I'm saying that uh, I think we need to do more research on that. Right. right. That, that's true. Right. <laughs> sure. Right. So that's what I think we need to be. Smart. Yes, please. You needed some triggering questions to ask more questions, please. I, I'm working on smart living and smart aging. Right. So my current question <coughs> is around that only. With your experience, uh, uh, how much the smart living is actually making our aging process much easier? Right. At the same time, is it helping in the longevity? So, it's a very good question, and I had just a brief slide on the smart health care we do, but I have a lot of other slides uh, because we have a uh, incorporated company, right, where we are actually looking into. Uh, so this continuous monitoring is very helpful at home. See, think about, let's say dementia patients goes to a doctor, two weeks or one month or two months later goes to the doctor again. In between, the effect of the medication, whether it positively or negatively, doctor has no idea unless a family member of the doctor calls, the patient calls the doctor, I'm having this problem, right? You, you don't know, but if I have at home continuous monitoring of the patients, and then I can develop a simple smartphone app, which will generate an alert for any anomaly, and that will go to the doctor, so the doctor will have real-time feed that this patient is having these issues. So that's one part, right? So anybody, who, that's one. We have also had another project on smart healthcare, where let's say there's a patient who has a memory loss, has to take medicine every six hours, but forgets. Nobody's at home, kids are in school. Let's say the children, adult children are working, right? So somebody comes back home in the evening, asks, Dad, did you take your medication? It has a memory loss, so you cannot even say yes or no, right? <coughs> because he forgets, right? So what we did, developed a simple, my colleague is in robotics, but a simple robot comes every six, programmed in such a way every six hours, comes with a tray with the medicine, looking at that the patient knows that he has to take it. So you can do simple things. Sometimes the patients with dementia, they may leave the house, opening the door and be in accident on the street. You can develop simple information, capturing through sensors and take the log, and remotely you can monitor what is happening inside your home, right? So there are many different applications out there in rehabilitation, aging, people with different types of cognitive impairments, right? So you basically manage their wellness as best as possible, right? And if you can manage their wellness, that means fall detection is a significant event for aging population, right? How do you prevent that? Most of the aging population are seriously harmed by fall. Right? So many of these things with simple technology, you can at least take good care, right? And that may leave that they'll stay healthier longer. Uh, that might give longer long longevity that you mentioned. And US Department of Health actually has a long study that home is the sanctuary. Nobody wants to live in a senior citizen home. Nobody wants to live in a rehabilitation home unless necessary. They feel much better at home psychologically, knowing that the environment is not as good as a senior citizen or rehabilitation center where 24 hours nurse is there to take care of them. Because psychologically, they feel more cheerful. And so US Department of Health actually had the study. If you can keep a patient at home for one year without sending to all these places, the whole country can save more than $200 billion. Because somebody is paying, either your insurance or your family members or your retirement saving. So all the people who need help, special help, if you can keep them at home with some technology, 
for basic needs, you can save on the average $250 billion per year. So, so that's why the smart environment, smart home, smart health is becoming more useful in that sense. Right. And he said there is no data available in the Indian context of the age in people or the age people. Right. Okay. And that's very surprising. So do you see with ISC and your background any possibility of really creating some information so that because we are treating ourselves as a young economy, but our data says that we are almost like twenty percent older people. Okay. So that's a lot of people. <coughs> I think there's a huge opportunity for innovation, startup companies, right? And because technology is becoming cheaper. Because it's not like you can get, let's say, Raspberry Pis, Arduinos, and sensors in $20, $50. And maybe much cheaper in India, I do not know, right? So, so there's an opportunity to build things. Only thing is that you have to build the right kind of algorithms and the software to, because detection accuracy, improvement, and reducing the false alarms are very important. Because you don't want to trigger the hospital or the doctor every now and then to get everybody ready because it's false alarm. So that's the challenge because any implantable sensors that you have or environmental sensor you have, there will be huge amount of noise and uncertainty. So how to filter through that and make the decisions with high accuracy, reducing the false alarm, those are the research challenges. Yeah. I'll be here and I'll be here until December 10th. So my office is CSA building 334. If anybody is interested in further discussions, because I did not do a good justice in many of the problems that I wanted to talk, uh, but you're more than welcome to come and, or contact me by email. Okay. Thank you, Professor Narahari. So I'll, I'll tell you one thing that Professor Narahari and I were almost contemporary. He was one year senior last two years of ME batch, we are the first one and a half years batch. So in one year, 1984, two batches of ME students graduated. Their batch in six months apart. So, so we know each other for a long time. It's a pleasure to work with and seeing his dynamic activities over here, always cheerful, always doing things in a positive way. And all the professors, thank you very much for coming. Really appreciate what we learned from you. Thank you.